obviously one of the greatest the greatest times in, in American history, like the space race going to the moon. Yeah. We had a national mission. Mm-hmm. We all came together. We all believed in it. And now we have lost social cohesion. Mm-hmm. The left has some kind of weird social cohesion, but it's not mm, rooted in... I don't know about that. I mean, <laughs> you, you know the way I... I wouldn't call that cohesion. Maybe maybe that's fair. Maybe that's fair. But they are connected somehow. You know mm. what I mean? Like they follow... They, they follow it's a, it's it's a it's a swarm of bats. Hive mind? I think much of it is su- yeah. superficial. Wasps. <laughs> Wasps. I think a lot Hornets. of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think a lot of it is superficial. I don't think it's like. I think you like strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, sort of thing. On the on the left. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's, it's not. It's yeah. I went to a Black Lives Matter protest last year in Brooklyn, and I held up a sign from that had a Kendrick Lamar quote that said on it, "A fatal attraction is common, and what we have common is pain." to try to spark a conversation about how, in many cases, the same uh, fears, traumas, what have you, that communities are experiencing also exist within the police officers that are policing those mm-hmm. communities. So, but that didn't actually spark any conversation. But what I did notice was that there was no actual spiritual underpinning. Uh, people knew what they didn't want. They didn't know what they wanted. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that, was not i mean yes I, I i met people who have become my friends for sure but that was not for example in comparison to the civil rights movement it, something that created actual sustainable community so i'm i'm curious i, I would question the stability and sustainability of I, s- some of the movements today i question whether or not they actually know what they don't want well that's fair <laughs> so one of, one, of, one of the things that uh, uh, I talk about a bit is... They claim to know what they don't want. I'll say that. Right. Well, they claim, sometimes claim to know what the solutions are. Abolish the police or defund the police. But yeah. they clearly don't want that because then when the police show up and arrest their political opponents, they cheer for it. Sure. One of the things I think we see uh, that I bring up often, why, the root of the culture war, in my opinion, or one of them, mm-hmm. was how algorithms were feeding people shock content for mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is, you're, let's say you're 10 years old in, in, 20, in 2009, mm-hmm. and you get on Facebook, even though you're not supposed to because it's you know, for 13-year-olds and up, but you know, kids are on it anyway. Yeah. All of a sudden, you see in your Facebook feed a police brutality video okay. of a black man being beaten by, by a cop. Okay. There were, there were websites that were making millions of dollars mm-hmm. posting nothing but police brutality videos because it's shocking and it mm-hmm. gets clicks. Outrage, yeah. So now you're 10. You see these videos and it's all and you click on it. Mm-hmm. So Facebook says, let's give you more. Mm-hmm. Then 10 years later, these videos have become dominant because it made so much money for people mm-hmm. that now there's a there's a there's someone who's voting who genuinely believes the world is nothing but police hunting down black people. Mm-hmm. Their whole worldview is built upon this fictional reality of these extreme instances that are actually exceedingly rare. Mm-hmm. They're bad and we should stop them, no doubt. Yeah. But exceedingly rare. Then they show up at a protest and quite literally verbatim, they say, police are hunting us down. Yeah. And if you try and tell them like, hey, that's not true. Mm -hmm. They get angry, they get violent. Mm -hmm. And then how do you calm someone down whose whole life has been built into this broken worldview? Well, that's not the space, first of all, (laughs) to try and calm someone someone down. For sure, but I don't mean like go to a protest and walk up to somebody who's angry and screaming and say, hey, you're wrong. I mean like, (laughs) even, even my friends, where it's like I've been, we, I was hanging hang out at their house, and I would say things like this. They'd be like, "You're wrong. You don't understand." And I can't believe you would say this stuff. Like I did. I thought you. I can't believe you're a racist. And I'm like, "Dude, why are you getting angry? You know what I mean? I'm not mad. I'm just. These things are reality." Well, I think it's. I don't know. You might be having a f- overly cerebral response to an emotional express uh, form of expression. That is correct. Uh, and I don't think you will. That doesn't match. Those two right. will never match. You need an emotional expression to respond to an emotional expression. But here's, here's or the right balance of cerebral and emotional. Here's the challenge I face with this. Uh, so when I, I used to do uh, nonprofit fundraising, canvassing, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, oh, hands down. I knew absolutely the emotional pitch was always better than the factual pitch. When I was working for a homeless shelter... I didn't go up to people and say, did you know that 17 children per day are found, blah, blah, blah. And and if we work together, the average annual budget of the homeless shelter will come. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. But if I said, yo, we had a kid last night. Mm -hmm. His parents both died in a fire. And now he's sleeping in the ditch. Mm -hmm. I I want you to think about that for two seconds. Like, what is that? Could you imagine not having parents? And then they'd be like, oh, my geez. Like, what do I got to do? The emotional was always better. But you know what? I don't like it. 
Because Why? it's disin because it's disingenuous. Why is it disingenuous? So when when you're honest with someone, you can be nice to them, you can be compassionate, empathize, and say, I am going to lead you to water mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be nice about it. But if you've got someone who's like fervently locked in a worldview over a decade of believing that cops are hunting down black people mm -hmm. and you try to say to, to them, you know, listen, I understand these things are horrible. Mm -hmm. I would like to help you in stopping them from happening. Mm -hmm. I would also like you to consider that, we, you know, these, these instances are exceedingly rare. Mm -hmm. And though we definitely should focus on fighting them, we should try to do it from a level-headed perspective. And they'll be like, no, you're wrong. You're not, you're wrong. I see the videos all the time. I go on Reddit and it's nothing but these videos. You're mm -hmm. trying to, you're trying to downplay. But why should your reaction be dependent upon theirs? Meaning just because they're lo maybe lost in a worldview, you're not, you're not changing your reaction or because they're going to be stuck or paralyzed. You're changing your reaction or you're, responding in a way that's empathetic because you believe in empathy you're responding in a way that's compassionate because you believe in compassion not because you say oh well compassion didn't work so i'm just gonna throw it throw it all out or throw my hands up imagine trying to tell someone two plus two equals five i don't think that's a good comparison <laughs> telling some i think you're comparing like a mathematic equation to like things that fundamentally involve human beings and which which goes beyond the abstraction. I'm not talking about the equation. I'm talking about the reaction people would have to being told something that they hold is fundamentally true and you're contradicting it. Okay, fair enough. So I think if you look at a person like Daryl Davis, the guy who successfully got dozens of members of the KKK to leave the KKK, right, by going to their rallies and being literally in community with them, his approach was not simply to go up to them and say, let me tell you why you're wrong. Right. His approach was to genuinely, deeply listen to them and to hold space for them for the purpose of holding space for them. Not for, this is, this is tricky, not for the purpose of convince, convincing them that they were wrong. They just so happened to be convinced that they were wrong by the mere presence, continuous presence. But, but he wasn't simply spewing facts at them. He was choosing to be in community with them. And that's not a cerebral, or a purely cerebral fact-based approach. You are correct, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, I did an event uh, with some friends. We had Daryl Davis speak and you're absolutely correct on that. Um, there were instances where he did challenge them, though, because sure. being their friend, he would. Right. Course, you could challenge them, you know, at, the, at a certain point, the challenge is no longer a threat to your identity. Mm. That's but you I have, think to, I th you have I th to pave that road first. I think you're absolutely right. I think we should just try to have more friends who we disagree with and just invite them into our spaces. It is difficult. It's extremely difficult. But again, this is the key. This is the hard part. Not inviting them in order to persuade them to change right. their mind. No, just invite people just to be friends. To just in the spirit of fellowship. Hmm. Yeah. You know, the challenge is, though, um, I think when you look at someone like Daryl Davis, there's, there's, a, there's a, cer a certain kind of like realization about who those people were who are nasty and racist because not all of them were converted. Sure. But a lot of them were converted. And the people who were converted were the people who weren't necessarily true believers, but they were in a community and they just held things to be true because that's all they ever heard. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the guys that Daryl Davis met with never even met a black person before. Sure. And so when they were like, oh, I know about this, but they weren't like evil. Yeah. So they were like, by all means, you can, I believe in freedom and you can talk and say what you want, but I hold these views. And then they realized a lot of those things weren't true just by talking to them. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges is there's an, when it comes to like the wokeness and the culture war, <laughs> You can't even get through to these people. You, um, let me tell you something. Mm -hmm. When we, we did this event in, uh, it, it was in, it was in, I can't remember the name of the town. So I lived in, I used to live in South, South Jersey. Okay. And we, there was this little theater, just, it's about an hour outside of Philadelphia. At the very last minute, self-proclaimed anti-fascists mm -hmm. threatened to burn the theater down. Mm -hmm. Because we were holding an event called ending uh, was ending racism violence and authoritarianism mm -hmm. we had an ar array of speakers libertarians conservative we had no identitarian speakers mm -hmm. mean either left actually no we had some progressive you know crt you okay. know activists we invited them but we didn't invite any right or white identitarian types okay daryl davis was the headline speaker because okay. we're huge fans yeah like, it's an amazing story and they threatened to burn the, th the theater down Within a, we had booked the thing a, a, almost a year in advance. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, the manager was like, "Don't worry, we've had Ann Coulter here before. We can deal with protest." Mm -hmm. 
he couldn't deal with the violence. Mm-hmm. So he terminated our contract and said, we will, we will not welcome you. And if you come, you will, we, will, we will call the police to have you arrested. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, sue me. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing we can really do. Yeah. We moved the main event to a casino okay. uh, on the other side of the river, which cut our capacity in half and did cause us financial damage. People weren't able to buy tickets. Yeah. But we had the event. We had Daryl Davis. However, a very brave uh, uh, couple... Or no, I'm sorry, sorry, they, they, had, they had divorced a very brave uh, man and woman who uh, had a, a bar across the street, mm-hmm. refused to cancel the after party in the face of threats and of, of violence and protest. And we told them, like, we are here for you. We got your back. We, we you know, don't worry. We will take care of you no matter what happens. Yeah. Like, we're in this together. And they said, we're having the after party. No one's going to bully us. We know who you are. We know who Daryl Davis is. We're, we're, we're proud. We agree. And this is insane. Mm-hmm. Antifa... And see our like, you know, woke activists, Black Lives Matter showed up and Daryl Davis. This is the craziest thing. Mm -hmm. Um, A black man who walked into Klan rallies, Mm -hmm. shook the hands with white supremacists and converted them, Mm -hmm. walked across the street to Antifa and they all started screaming Nazi at him Mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let him speak. He ended up posting on Facebook a very viral post where he said, I am shocked Mm -hmm. in all of my efforts meeting with white supremacists as a black man. They have at least given me the chance to speak, to have the conversation, to become friends. Mm -hmm. But by simply walking across the street, they Mm -hmm. won't even let them talk at all. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. If you want to see the full show, come back to this channel, youtube.com slash TimCast IRL, Monday through Friday at 8 p.m., where you can leave comments and super chat. And we actually will read your comments on the show. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. And if you want exclusive members-only content, segments you can't get anywhere else, go to TimCast.com, become a member, and we even have full bonus episodes. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.